Consider these numbers. $3.7 trillion increase in GDP. $4.2 trillion in additional bank deposits. 95 million net new jobs. Now, what if I told you that achieving those economic results only requires leveraging existing mobile technology, all for the purpose of providing digital financial services to the 2 billion un- and underbanked people in the emerging markets? So to put that in context, that's one-third of the world's adult population. In this case, what's next could be right around the corner, but we'll only get there if we pay special attention to including the largest emerging market of them all, women. I'm Mary Ellen Iskandarian, President and CEO of Women's World Banking, the global nonprofit dedicated to providing low-income women in developing countries with the financial products and services they need to build security and prosperity. I joined Women's World Banking 10 years ago when the discussion of women's economic empowerment usually centered on a poor woman, maybe in a sari, who bought a sewing machine with a microloan, created a garment business in her home, and put her kids through school. The social benefit of this op was obvious, but no one talked about the economic growth that was lost by excluding her from the formal financial system or the market opportunity for, mar for financial institutions if they embraced her as a client. So much of this has changed in the last decade, in large part due to the introduction of digital te technology as a channel to deliver financial service. Nevertheless, over half of the world's unbanked are women, and the gender gap in access hasn't budged despite great progress elsewhere in financial inclusion. But what does it really mean to be financially excluded? Let me introduce you to Nwakpa. She lives in Lagos, Nigeria. She's 45 years old and is married with three children. She runs a fruit stall in Balogun, which is one of the largest open-air markets in Lagos. And she conducts roughly 100 transactions a day all in cash. And then when she closes her business at the end of the day, she performs a series of household financial transactions. Again, all in cash. She takes precious time away from her business every month to travel with considerable risk to her physical security to pay her children's school fees. And she pays for food and other household necessities, all in cash. But when I met her, her biggest worry was that her husband or other family members or neighbors would find the money that she saved, literally, under her mattress. So Nwakwa's fruit stand is the, in the middle of this bustling market that's teeming with people and commerce. And overlooking the market, literally just a few steps from Nwakwa's business, is a branch of Diamond Bank, a large commercial and retail bank. So when I ask Nwakpa, why doesn't she deposit her, her earnings into a savings account at the bank? She first says, well, you know, the bank isn't really for me, and they're not going to want me as a customer anyway. And then she mentions that she doesn't have time to leave her stall and stand in line in the, in the branch to deposit the money, because every moment she's away from her business is lost revenue. So I walked across the road to see the Diamond Bank branch manager and ask him why wasn't he serving the businesses that were practically sitting on his doorstep. To my amazement, he gave me a completely perplexed look and then asked me in genuine confusion, what businesses, what potential clients was I talking about? The hundreds of traders in Balogun Market were entirely invisible to that branch manager. Luckily for Nwakpa and the other market traders, Diamond Bank's senior management had started to see things a little differently. A powerful combination of regulatory change and technology would serve as matchmakers to bring the bank and these clients together. 
The Central Bank of Nigeria had recognized the threat to their country's financial system from excluding 70% of the population. And in response, they had relaxed know your customer regulations for low balance, no frills bank accounts. At the same time, digital technology had driven down the cost of servicing these accounts. In one fell swoop, Nwakpa moved from complete invisibility to being a potential client for the bank. Women's World Banking worked with Diamond Bank to design a savings product called Beta that incorporated Nwakpa's concerns. Because remember, Nwakpa said she didn't have time to leave her stall and go stand in line for the bank. So we made sure that the savings account could be accessed through her cell phone or a point of sale terminal or ATMs. In addition to convenience, though, Nwakpa also wanted to feel like the bank really cared about her. So the marketing materials we designed were all drafted in pidgin language using simple language and visual elements. Diamond Bank also introduced field agents called beta friends that come directly to the trader's stalls, collect deposits and manage withdrawals, all via mobile technology, as well as providing basic financial and digital education. Three years later, there are 300,000 beta clients, and Diamond Bank has rolled out additional savings and credit products for this client segment, and now we're helping them develop a health insurance policy that can be accessed through the beta digital platform. So the Beta product has been a winning example of the power that digital technology has to include the previously excluded. But perhaps the product has even more interesting lessons to teach us about the limits of technology. Even here at the What's Next conference, human connectivity is as important as technological solutions, particularly to reach women like Nwakpa. A six-month evaluation of the Beta product revealed that depositing funds through the daily visit of the Beta friend was the most popular channel by far for both men and women. In fact, 72% of the transactions are conducted with the Beta friend. And we hear from clients that having a friend encourages them to save even more, and they feel badly if they don't have deposits to make. The lesson seems clear. If we are to realize the potential for digital financial inclusion, we can't forget everything we know about customer service in a technology-driven world and the need to build trust through human relationships. For women in particular, that lesson seems well worth learning. Ensuring women's access to and control over financial resources is a force multiplier that brings with it better education, healthcare, housing, nutrition for families and communities. And that's at a rate 30% higher than it is for men. And there's now a growing body of evidence linking women's access to finance to a whole raft of intangible benefits as well. A woman with control over financial resources and the knowledge of how to use them plays a greater role in household decision-making, is more politically active, and is even less vulnerable to domestic violence. I have seen time and time again how a woman's confidence and self-esteem flourishes when she is empowered in this way. And you need no better example than Wakpa herself. Better system for us. It has saved us from losing our money, from, you know, people that we don't know. But this one, you get it right into your phone. Wow. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Multiply that by a billion. Thank you. <laughs>